Welcome to the University of Michigan Dentistry Podcast Series, promoting oral health care worldwide. Today I'm going to talk about the design and use of ultrasonic scalars for prophylaxis technique. The ultrasonic technique is, just, is based on the principle of converting regular household current, which is 60 cycle current, into a 25,000 cycle current. And in turn, this 25,000 cycle current is converted to mechanical energy, which makes the tip of a scalar vibrate at 25,000 times per second. The distance of movement of this tip is about one ten thousandth of an inch. Let me explain to you the variety of designs of the ultrasonic instruments. Just uh, by way of contrast, this instrument down here is a Columbia scaler. The Columbia scaler uh, head is quite small, and in contrast to some of the Cavatron tips that you can see here adjacent to it, uh, many of these tips are a little bit larger. Perhaps I can turn this so that you can see just a little better. Now if we could pan down the array of scalars that we have laid out here, you'll notice that all of these scalar tips are slightly blunted. None of them have a sharp edge. The reason for having these blunted is that the process by which the cavitron is used does not actually scale the calculus from the root surface, but it sets up a vibration which tends to set up a cavitation in the calculus and then removes it in that manner. Moving on down the list of instruments here, these instruments here are quite analogous to an ordinary uh, periodontal file. These instruments uh, next in line here are designed uh, after the Kirkland periodontal knives and are also designed uh, to vibrate uh, in the Cavitron instrument. And moving down the line a little bit further here, we have these instruments which are designed to be used in the anterior portion of the mouth. And then the last two sets of instruments here are the one is designed after the, the 2S instrument that you have in your kit. And then adjacent to that is a standard 2S instrument uh, that you have in your kit for hand scaling. Now let me just take, usually uh, when the ultrasonic instrument comes, it comes complete with uh, probably three of these tips. And let me try to describe to you the difference in use of each of these tips. The first one here, could we come in pretty close on this? The first tip here is used basically for scaling supra and subgingival calculus in the anterior portion of the mouth, uh, probably including the anterior teeth and maybe as far back as some of the bicuspid teeth. It is also uh, recommended for use of removing amalgam overhangs. And this tip is called the P1. Now in addition to that tip, there is another tip that has essentially the same design, only is a little bit larger than the tip that I just showed you. This tip is used mainly for supergingival calculus removal from the labial and lingual aspect of the teeth. And it is also used for heavy black tar or stain in heavy smokers. And uh, the action of this tip is used with an erasing motion. The tip of the instrument is used to scale with rather than the sides of the instrument. Now the most, uh, and this tip is called a P3. Now the most universal tip used for scaling uh, both supra and subgingival uh, interproximally in the posterior portion of the mouth is what we call the P10. And uh, in contrast to the, the P1 and the P3, this instrument is used, you do not use the tip of the instrument when scaling, but you use the side of the instrument when scaling. 
And this is shaped very similar to the 13 and 14 curettes that you have, or the 5 and 6 curette. The ultrasonic scaling device that I'd like to demonstrate to you this morning is the Cavitron. Uh, Ritter also makes a unit. Uh, this one's made by Dent Supply. The unit is uh, turned on here at the power supply, and depending on the size of the tip of the instrument, uh, different amounts of power are used. Generally, uh, you'll find that uh, probably a power setting of between two and three is the proper setting to use. If uh, the response that you're getting from a patient is uh, uncomfortable, uh, and many times you will need to cut back a little bit on the amount of power being used. The water adjustment is used to cool the tip of the instrument. As we mentioned, the heat is produced when the ultrasonic scaler is being used. You should use enough water so that you get a fine a slurry of water hitting the exact tip of the instrument. And uh, in this manner, it should enable you to keep the instrument cool enough to work with. It's important that you use a very light touch when you use the scaler to eliminate uh, heat buildup. The handpiece is inserted in this unit here. And generally, when you're inserting the, the handpiece, you will find that it traps a slight amount of air in this column here. And so whenever you change hand pieces, it's important that you bleed this line of air. And this is done in this manner. It's just a matter of just holding this tip in an upright position until water has a chance to run through the line. And uh, if we can move in fairly close on this, I think I can show you how water hits the tip of that instrument. This is adjusted uh, just about right. We might have just a little bit more power going here, and perhaps just a little bit less water. You want to have it hit in a, in a fine slurry as it hits the tip of the instrument. Now, obviously, uh, when you're using this in the mouth, this can be a slight problem in collecting the amount of water that gets in the patient's mouth. I think you'll find it's easiest to use this instrument with an assistant. Uh, if you're going to use it without an assistant, it's important to use it in a fairly upright position so that the patient uh, uh, does not have a problem with the amount of water that accumulates. Let me try to demonstrate uh, to you the use of this instrument for calculus removal. When using the instrument, you'll find that, that the thing that causes the removal of calculus is not just the vibrating tip. It's the vibrating tip along with the water, which tends to set up a cavitation in the calculus itself. Uh, the ultrasonic so, or waves that this sets up will not actually shatter the calculus, but you need to actually hit the calculus with the tip of the instrument in order to remove it. And uh, let me start here. Moved in a, in a wiping motion like this. And we've got a, a very hefty piece of calculus there. This would generally be what we expect to come up with uh, in using that uh, instrument on a root surface. The calculus eventually, uh, by hitting it over and over, begins to finally fracture away. I think the one thing that you see on this tooth that you may not see in the mouth as much is the fact that these teeth are a little bit dry, and so the calculus tends to fracture out a little easier on this extracted tooth than it would in the mouth. There is one problem in using this instrument in the mouth, and that is that you may take and just burnish over the calculus without actually removing it. And uh, this can also be a problem with the use of hand scalers. Now, in contrast to that, uh, let me insert another tip here and see if we can show you its use for stain removal. The, the tips are just drawn out in this manner here. And this... Uh, P3 would be the tip that's generally used for stain removal. I would insert it like this. Whenever you've inserted the instrument, it's important to bleed the line again. We've got about the right adjustment on that instrument again. You can see that we have kind of a slurry of spray coming off the tip. 
you can make pretty well examine the amount of heat that's coming off the tip of that instrument just by taking and running it on your thumbnail. And uh, the thumbnail is a very sensitive uh, area for determining the amount of heat that you've got in buildup. And uh, it also gives you an indication of how hard to press. You actually have very little tactile sensation when using this instrument uh, because the, the tip vibrates. It's kind of like using a high speed in dentistry. You have to be familiar with where you're placing the instrument uh, rather than relying on your tactile sense for knowing uh, where the instrument is going. Uh, let me take one of these teeth here with a fair amount of heavy stain on it and see what I can show you. I'm going to come up from the angle that you couldn't come if you were working in the mouth. Uh, but for purposes of demonstration, I think this will show you a little bit easier. Could we come in just a little bit tighter on that and see if I can show the... That's fine. See, it's just a matter of using the tip of that instrument. Just using it with a wiping motion back and forth until all of the stain is removed. Now it's possible that polishing may have removed this stain pretty well. But I think that uh, most people have found the Cavitron to be a very useful instrument, at least for stain removal on the enamel surface of the tooth. Now let me put these aside and see if I can just hand scale a tooth here. And we'll come back and see if we can't show you the difference between a Cavitron instrumented surface and a hand scale surface. The tooth on the left here was instrumented with the Cavitron, and the tooth on the right was instrumented with the standard curette scalers. Although it's difficult to show here, I think you can get an indication that probably the Cavitron surface, the portion of the Cavitron surface is the coronal or the incisal one-third of that root you can see that there is some root surface roughness remaining. In addition to just scaling on the tooth surface on the right, we have also root planed that surface. And uh, we can get an indication that that surface is a lot smoother than the surface on the left. In actuality, there is probably a difference of about 10 micro inches. The Cavitron surface uh, averages out to be around 17 micro inches, and the instrumented surface uh, may average out to be between six and nine micro inches. The reason that the Cavitron produces this slightly rougher surface is the fact that in addition to the fact that the tip moves back and forth, it also moves slightly in an up and down direction. And so it tends to chatter or bang against that root surface, producing a slightly rougher surface. Now, in addition to knowing that the Cavitron produces a rougher surface, uh, you must decide in your own mind whether or not a difference of 10 micro inches is biologically significant. Let's kind of review, in my estimation, what the Cavitron should be used for. I think in general you'll find that the Cavitron may be a useful instrument for heavy, super gingival deposits, uh, particularly limited to the enamel of the tooth. In addition to calculus deposits uh, super gingivally, it has been proven to be a good instrument for heavy stain removal, particularly in the instances of heavy uh, cigarette stain, heavy uh, black uh, stain produced from pipe smoking. I would also think that uh, on occasion that the Cavitron may be a useful instrument uh, in people with uh, trench mouth or Vincent's infection. It enables you to go in there and flush out the area pretty nicely without uh, traumatizing the area very much on the initial appointment. Now, some of the drawbacks of using the Cavitron are the fact that it does produce this rough surface. And as I said before, you must decide uh, in your own mind what the significance of this rough surface is. I would suggest that uh, the instrument should not be used routinely on root surfaces uh, because it will remove calculus, but it will not do an adequate job of root planing. The uh, heat produced by the tip of the instrument can also be a consideration. In other words, uh, since the water stream hits the tip of the instrument, in inserting it deep into a pocket, uh, say a four, five, six millimeter pocket, you may find that you've lost that water spray hitting the tip of the instrument. Studies have tended to confirm the fact that the buildup in heat will cause soft tissue necrosis. Some of the uh, size of the Cavitron instruments also limits their placement uh, deep in the subgingival area. Whether or not to use the Cavitron should be based on 
these considerations. You've been listening to a presentation from the University of Michigan School of Dentistry, which is dedicated to supporting open learning and open educational resources. This recording is licensed under the Creative Commons. It may be reused and redistributed for nonprofit use. Please attribute materials to the University of Michigan School of Dentistry and redistribute under this same license. For more information on how this and other University of Michigan School of Dentistry recordings may be used, visit www.dent.umich.edu/license.